This is a homily for the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 to 21. Today's Gospel is again set in the Tuesday of what we now call Holy Week, the final week in the life of Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, Holy Week begins with Jesus entering Jerusalem on Monday, not on Sunday, as in Mark's Gospel. As Jesus enters the Holy City, the people acclaim him, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord. Jesus then went to the temple and cast out the money changers and those selling animals for sacrifice. You have turned my father's house into a bandit's den, he tells them. That incident would have occurred in the court of the Gentiles, a large area that even non-Jews were permitted to enter. This large courtyard surrounding the temple was the largest public space in the city, and it invariably served as a flashpoint for unrest. In his work entitled The Wars of the Jews, the Jewish historian Josephus describes the vibrant instability of the city during the great festivals such as Passover, when the city was overcrowded with pilgrims. It was then, he writes, that sedition is most likely to break out. With tens of thousands of pilgrims present, you can imagine how alarmed the temple authorities would have been at the disturbance that Jesus had caused. The Roman garrison was housed in the Antonia Fortress, and from there they had a commanding view over the temple and its courtyards. Jesus leaves the temple and stays the night in Bethany. Bethany is on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives, less than three kilometres from Jerusalem, perhaps a 40-minute walk. On Tuesday morning, Jesus and the disciples return from Bethany to the temple. So, on this Tuesday morning, we're again in the temple precincts. And, as I suggested a few weeks ago, the most likely location is is the portico of Solomon. The portico of Solomon was a long colonnade located on the eastern side of the temple's outer courtyard. In chapter 10 of John's Gospel, we're told that on one occasion, Jesus was walking up and down the portico of Solomon. And the Acts of the Apostles tell us that it's the place where the apostles Peter and John spoke to the people. Let's have a quick overview of what has happened so far on this Tuesday morning. On the way to the holy city, Jesus was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he goes up to it, but finds nothing on it but leaves. He says to it, May you never bear fruit again. And instantly the fig tree withers. As I suggested last Sunday, this anticipates the condemnation of the chief priests and elders of the people in the parables that will soon follow. The Jewish leadership has not produced the fruits of righteousness and justice. Once within the temple precincts, Jesus is challenged by the chief priests and elders of the people about what he had done on the previous day. By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus responds to this question with the parable of the father and his two sons. The father asks one of his sons to go and work in the vineyard. The son refuses, but then has a change of heart and does what his father asks of him. When the father asks the second son to go and work in the vineyard, he replies, Certainly, sir, but then does nothing. Like the fig tree that has failed to bear fruit, the Jewish leadership are like the son who says yes, but does nothing. Jesus continues with the parable of the wicked tenants. The chief priests and the scribes realized that this parable was directed at them. 
and they would have liked to arrest him, but they were afraid of how the crowds would react. Jesus addresses them once again with a parable about a wedding feast. That was last Sunday's Gospel. The parable of the father and his two sons, the wicked tenants, and the wedding banquet were all directed against the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the disciples of the Pharisees, in company with the Herodians, appear on the scene. They approach Jesus with a seemingly innocuous question about the payment of taxes to Caesar. Despite their flattering introductory words, they are not seeking instruction. They are hoping to entrap him by what he says. Let's pause here for a moment to see who the people are that are involved in the events of this Tuesday. Josephus mentions three schools of thought among the Jews at this time, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and Essenes. The New Testament, especially the Gospels, mentions the Pharisees frequently, but it says far less about the Sadducees and nothing at all about the Essenes. We know relatively little about the Sadducees, and all the information that we now have about them comes from texts written by people who were not Sadducees, some of whom were actively opposed to them. The chief priests and the leading aristocrats seem mostly to have belonged to the Sadducees. The chief priest wielded considerable power and formed the heart of the Jewish aristocracy. The Roman governors dealt with the chief priest and particularly with the high priest who was chosen from their number. They were held responsible for the general conduct of the populace. So you can understand why they were alarmed at what Jesus had done in the temple on the previous day. For Josephus and the New Testament, the Sadducees are high priests and aristocrats who deny the resurrection of the dead. However, not all priests, high priests and aristocrats were Sadducees. Many were Pharisees, and many were not members of any group at all. Today we meet the Pharisees. Most scholars today agree that the name Pharisee derives from the Hebrew and Aramaic parush or perushi, which means one who is separated. The plural is perushim. They were zealous in their observance of the Torah and presumably were called perushim because they separated themselves from anyone who did not share their zeal. In Jewish antiquities, Josephus tells us that the Pharisees were extremely influential among the masses, whereas the Sadducees were supported only by the people of highest standing. At the time of Jesus, the Pharisees included both priests and lay people among their number. They believed that the ancestral tradition, what would later be called the Oral Torah, was just as binding as the written Torah of Moses. The ancestral tradition included observance of the purity laws, tithing, and numerous details in the laws regarding oaths, Sabbath, and marriage. The Herodians were supporters of Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas was Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, coloured purple on this map. Since he retained his power through Roman sufferance, the Herodians would be expected to support paying the tax. The alliance between Pharisees and Herodians is unexpected and unusual. They were ideological enemies. So... The disciples of the Pharisees and some Herodians asked Jesus a question about paying taxes to Caesar. Master, we know that you are an honest man and teach the way of God in an honest way, 
and that you are not afraid of anyone because a man's rank means nothing to you. Tell us your opinion then. Is it permissible to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Taxation was a volatile and incendiary issue. It was a hot topic. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us about a revolt led by Judas the Galilean. In 6 AD, when Jesus was a young boy, Judas the Galilean led a revolt precisely on the issue of taxation. Judas taught that God was the sole ruler and that all Jews were obliged to collaborate in the establishment of the sole rule of God. In practice, this amounted to a refusal to pay tax. Needless to say, the Romans crushed the revolt mercilessly, leaving crosses around the countryside with dead and dying revolutionaries on them. It was a chilling reminder. Taxation was compulsory, not optional. Ever since the Jewish homeland had been added to the Roman Empire in 63 BC, Rome had required a large annual tribute from the Jewish people. Most of the tribute was collected through taxes on land and agricultural production, but there was also a poll or head tax. The poll tax had to be paid in Roman currency by men, women and slaves between the ages of 12 and 65. It was a tax of one denarius per annum. Roman taxation was onerous, not only because it was economically burdensome, it also symbolised the Jewish homeland's lack of sovereignty. It underlined the oppression of the Jews by a foreign overlord. The coin in which the poll tax had to be paid, the denarius, was offensive to devout Jews. The coin that you can see here is a denarius from that time and it bears the image of Tiberius, the Roman emperor during the public ministry of Jesus. It had the following inscription on it. Tiberius Caesar, august son of the divine Augustus. And on the reverse side, high priest. That, incidentally, is why it was necessary, from a Jewish point of view, to have money changes in the temple. People could not bring coins into the temple precinct that bore an image of the emperor. But even worse, coins that made blasphemous claims, calling the previous emperor, Augustus, divine. That was an abhorrent claim to any devout Jew. Here you can see Jewish coins that were acceptable for use in the temple precinct. So, do we pay taxes or not? The trap had been skillfully set. If Jesus had said, no, don't pay the tax, he could be charged with sedition the blatant rejection of Roman authority. If, on the other hand, he had said, yes, pay the tax, they could then denounce him as a Roman collaborator, and he would have lost favour with the crowd. For both economic and religious reasons, Jews resented Roman rule and taxation. Whichever way Jesus answered would be a win for the Jewish authorities. If he said no, they could have him arrested. If he said yes, he loses popularity with the crowd and that would make it much easier for them to get rid of him. Jesus, of course, realises the trap they had set for him and he sets a counter trap. Let me see the money you pay the tax with. They produce a denarius, a coin equal to a day's wage. Jesus presses the point. Whose head is this? Whose name? This strategy has forced his questioners to reveal to the crowd that here in the temple precincts they had with them a coin bearing Caesar's image. That would have been extremely embarrassing. They had been caught out bringing a blasphemous coin into the sacred precinct of the temple. They give the only answer they can. 
It is Caesar's image on the coin. Very well, says Jesus, give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. It's interesting to note that many contemporary readers of the Gospel see in this saying of Jesus an endorsement of what we now call the separation of church and state. The American president, Thomas Jefferson, said in 1808, Erecting the wall of separation between church and state is absolutely essential in a free society. That, however, is not what Jesus was saying. And anyway, it would have been a meaningless distinction at that time. What belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God? For Jesus and his Jewish contemporaries, the answer was obvious. What belongs to God? Well, everything belongs to God. As we read in Psalm 24, The Lord's is the earth and its fullness, the world and all its peoples. So then, what's left for Caesar? Well, nothing is left for Caesar. The Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has written extensively about this so-called division between church and state in his book A Secular Age. He examines a transition that has taken place between pre-modern societies and the modern Western state. Taylor writes, The change I want to define and trace is one which takes us from a society in which it was virtually impossible not to believe in God to one in which faith, even for the staunchest believer, is one human possibility among others. Belief in God is no longer axiomatic. He describes the individual who lived in pre-modern societies, the porous self. By contrast, the individual in the modern Western state is the buffered self. Let me use an example to highlight this transition. The porous self. Think of an individual swimming underwater. They are immersed in water. It is all around them. This is the porous self. The buffered self is like someone standing by a pool. The pool is there for those who might want to go for a swim. It's one option among many others. Perhaps you'd prefer to go for a walk or work out in the gym. So there you have the distinction. One person immersed in water... For the other, it is one option among many. By way of analogy, there was a time when religion was an integral part of the fabric of society. People were immersed in religion like the swimmer in water. But now religious belief is one option among many others. In what ways do we live as a buffered self? Well, we tend to compartmentalise our lives. Just think of all the things that we do during the course of a day or during the week. We socialise, mow the lawn, eat together as a family, spend time in front of the TV, try to keep fit, spend time with the children, do household chores like washing and ironing, shopping and cooking, We go to work. We go on holidays. We spend time travelling to and from work. We spend time on social media. We may devote some time to our life of faith. And, of course, we sleep. But this is not what the Christian life should look like. Our life of faith is not just one compartment in our lives alongside many others, and it can be jettisoned if we're too busy. The Christian life places Christ and our life of faith at the very centre of our lives, and it should inform every aspect of our lives and embrace all 
that we do. In a world of competing loyalties, our ultimate allegiance is to God and his kingdom. Today's gospel won't give us any assistance in filling out our tax returns, nor does it pass judgment on whether or not taxes are legitimate. It takes taxes for granted. Nor can today's gospel be used to justify a separation between church and state. Jesus uses a confrontation between the disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians, a confrontation not of his own making, to remind us of the greatest commandment. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the story that we'll hear in next Sunday's Gospel.